over, but at all times in life we <coughs> draw upon the learning and the ability of medical doctors. And that was the case many, many years ago, even back to the time of our Lord. You'll remember that Luke, co-worker with Paul, who wrote the Gospel of Luke and Acts, was, as Paul called him, the beloved physician. Now, it was a long time before they began called doctors. It's recent times, with a medical degree, terminating in a doctorate. But they were physicians, and they're still known as physicians, but basically they were always called physicians and not doctor. So if we call Dr. Luke, Dr. Luke, he, if he were alive right now with the same idea he had in his mind, of, he probably wouldn't know what we're talking about, but he's a physician, one who treats illnesses of various kinds. Our Lord is the great physician of whom there is no greater. Once Matthew Levi made Jesus a great feast and invited many of his publican and sinner friends to that feast. And as was often the case, the Pharisees and scribes criticized him and his disciples for eating with publicans and sinners. Now, publican in those days meant a Jew who was taking up taxes for Rome, and the Jews despised their fellow Jews who would do that. The Lord, of course, chose Matthew from the collection seat where he was taking taxes. And thus, we see Matthew Levi doing that. But when he was criticized in Luke 5, 31 and 32, Luke tells us that he said concerning his association with those sinners, he didn't fellowship them in their sin, but they were there at the feast. They that are in health need no physician, but they that are sick. Now, I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repent, Luke 5, 31 through 32. How do you do that except you have a, enough association with them that you can teach them and reveal to them what they need to know? I'll pause here and say this. Our country is getting to the point to where we don't need to just say repent of your sins. We need to teach them what sin is. They have no compunction when they engage in sin. That is the fact that they could be wrong and their conscience bothers them. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't some people who aren't knowledgeable enough to know that they're against God when they sin and they know what sin is. But more and more in a secular atheistic society, people wink at sin, laugh at sin, don't think it's a problem. Well, it's the only thing that keep you out of heaven. It's the only thing that will send you to hell. Your folks may hate you. You uh, may be the poorest person in the world. You may not have a good education, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, those things in themselves are not necessarily sinful. But sin is the transgression of God's law, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. And the people on Pentecost, though they were devout Jews, very religious, were charged with murdering Christ. And they came to realize we have murdered the very one that the law told us to look for, the Messiah. And they cried out, being pricked in their heart by the truth. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Matthew, Mark, to also, I should say, record the Lord's words in which he likened himself to a physician and sinful men to those who are sick. Well, you get some people today won't go to the doctor when they are sick, but people who, who are sick need to, as we say, go to the doctor. They need a physician. That may be true in the matter of human situations and ignorance and lack of knowledge and technology. There may not be anything that can be done for you for that given situation. We don't have to worry about that when it comes to Christ being the great physician, when it comes to forgiveness of our sins, our transgressions of God's will that separated us from him, Romans 3.23 and 6.23. When we analyze the aim and the work 
and the accomplishments of Christ in his earthly ministry, then I think we see that God in his infinite wisdom did a great thing for us in comparing Christ to a physician when it comes to the full meaning as it's applied to the matter of our sins and what we're going to do about them. I'm responsible for my sins. Other people may have had a hand in it. They may have influenced me for bad. They may have sinned. But I'm responsible for violating God's law. I'm responsible for my conduct. I'm accountable to God for my conduct. And when you reach the stage of in your mentality and so forth where you are accountable to God for your conduct, the Bible says in Romans 3.23, we sin. Thus, God has diagnosed all accountable people on this earth with being diseased with sin. And He, through His Son, is the only remedy. Well, let's study this idea from the standpoint of Christ being the great physician. A good physician must recognize man's need for a physician. Now, I don't know all the reasons people become a medical doctor. But I'd like to think that a physician wants to help people. And they may very well be very brilliant and they may have gone through a lot of study and they will have. But they're going to have to have some way of sympathizing with people in their diseases and in their suffering if they would really be the best physicians possible. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ recognized the need man had for spiritual treatment and for healing. We read in Ephesians 2.12 as he addressed the church in the city of Ephesus in Asia that he from heaven being omniscient knowing all that's the object of knowledge saw men Without hope. Without hope. What does that mean? Without expectation of eternal life. What could they expect dying in their sins? Eternal separation from God in the devil's hell. In the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Christ knew that without the shedding of blood, life's in the blood, there's no remission of sins. So he wrote in Hebrews 9, that is, the inspired writer, Hebrews 9, verse 22. However, he also knew, as the law of Moses required of the Jews, that the blood of bulls and goats could not provide the remedy for sin, Hebrews 9, 22. He was touched, the scripture says, again in the Hebrews epistle, with the feeling of our infirmities, Hebrews four fifteen, because he became a man just like you are and I am. He's god but he became man. He's the only being like him, God and man. So he knows what it's like to live here and undergo what we're undergoing. Finally, he knew that only by the sacrifice of himself could this most dreaded of diseases, sin, be healed. And again from the writer of Hebrews, the Holy Spirit said this he did once for all when he offered himself for the sins of men. He is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Now because the Lord recognized man's exceedingly desperate need for a spiritual physician, then he is truly the great physician. He understands our plight. Because he's been here and done that as a man, as we are. Another point is that a good physician must have desire and determination to meet the needs of people. I think it takes unusual desire and determination to bear the rigors and expense of medical school in order to become a physician. And to do all of the hard and stress-filled work 
that a dedicated physician does once he has actually prepared himself. Thus, they talk about a practicing physician. And I know a lot of that varies on, from person to person. But that always does in anything. But it still takes a lot. I had one doctor tell me that he said, it just was very hard on me to get through medical school. It took an unusual desire and great determination in Christ to be able to meet the need of men for redemption from sin. When you read of him in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, know that his ministry among men did not have to take place. That he left the form of God and took upon himself the form of man as a servant and put himself in your position and my position. After all, as the second person of the Godhead, John 1, 1 and 2, verse 14, he created this whole world, but you know when he created it, it was perfect. And then man sinned. Sin came into the world, and the whole world was corrupted by sin. And yet he still came into this world and saw what man had done to it. And as a man lived through all of it and lived as God would live among men. We ask the question, how would God live on this earth like us? Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He knew all the rigors of the work that he would have to do on earth, but he still came. Have you ever had the statement, you got yourself into something, you said, if I had known it was going to take all of this, I would never have started. Well, imagine the Lord saying that about the redemptive work. He was born in a stable in a manger as a bassinet. That's all he had. He started out with nothing. And even his family had to take him away into Egypt because Herod sought to kill him. So he fled from his enemies and them leading him and taking him. Somebody says, well, they were poor when they got there. Had they had the funds to go to, to go to Egypt where God sent them to escape Herod? God takes care of everything. What was it the wise men brought to him? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They financed the trip. And you say, how do you know that? Well, I don't, except I know those were very expensive things, and gold is still expensive. And do a little thinking. God takes care of you when you're willing to do his will, no matter the sacrifice. He was constantly bombarded with challenges and all kinds of taunts and, from his opponents. He even said, you know, birds of there have their nests, the foxes have their holes, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He depended on everybody else for sustenance while he was on the earth. He had a life of strenuous labor that would be physically exhausting. You think about what he did. Sometimes we just read through it and don't realize he lived day to day just like those Jews did, only lived as a poor Jew, dependent on everybody. And finally, as he knew before he ever came to earth, the very people who should have recognized him Rejected him, had him arrested, false trials, crucified him. And it all fit into the plan so Christ could die for us as a sin offering. In spite of the foreknowledge of all the terrible shame and agony, suffering that would be his, he had to have the extraordinary desire and determination to do that for you and for me and for all mankind, that we might be saved from our sins, that he would shed his blood to purchase the church, Acts 20 and verse 28, and make a way where we could contact that blood in the waters of baptism as a believer who repented of sins, confessed Christ, that we could be sinless and added to the church, and to live a faithful Christian life, 1 Corinthians 15:58. In Hebrews 12 and verse 2, the scripture simply says he despised the cruelty of the crucifixion on the cross and yet for the joy set before him, says he endured it, he triumphed. In writing to the church at Philippi, 
in verses 6 through 8, chapter 2, Paul reminds the Philippian brethren that he emptied himself of his place with God. He chose to leave the form of deity, take on himself a form of a man, and therefore subject himself to Satan to be tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. He was in that condition because he became a man. But the scripture says in that same passage that he became obedient unto the death of the cross. Then Peter would write to Christians in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21 that he left us an example, a pattern to follow. That we could suffer as he suffered and live as he lived and emulate him. So the whole desire of the Christian is to live like Jesus lived. I don't know how to do that unless I study his will in his words. And you don't find his will for your life or my life or anybody else except in the words of his last will and testament. That's the New Testament of the Bible. So there must be this dedication, this willingness to undergo rigorous work. And he had it. He exemplified it. A good physician also must be qualified. We've mentioned the study. We've mentioned experience. And in doing so or participating in those things, one gains the skills of a good physician. Now, of course, Christ didn't have to go, if we say, go to school to do that. He was supremely qualified and prepared to be the great physician. If you will read through the book of Hebrews, which we went through not long ago, that's a lot of what's upheld about Christ. The Jews who had believed and obeyed the gospel, they had believed in Christ as the Messiah, the Son of God, but they were not uh, staying with it. They were actually considering leaving the faith, going back under Judaism. Then the writer of Hebrews points out the situation with Christ. Hebrews 1, 2 through 4 He's the heir of all things. He's the creator of the world. He's the effulgence of God's glory. And he's above all angels with a better name than theirs. Peter, one of the apostles, 1 Peter 1, 18 through 20, wrote that that was foreknown even before the foundation of the world. What was foreknown? That Christ must come and offer his precious blood as the remedy for sin. Then again in the epistle to the Hebrews, in Hebrews 10, 5, 5, the writer said of his father, speaking on behalf of Christ, a body didst thou prepare for me. Then in that same chapter in verse 9, he has Christ saying, Lo, I'm come to do thy will so he's qualified as our great physician of which there's no greater and could be no greater by living above and free from sin in Hebrews 4.15 we know that one he was tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin and then Peter would write in 1 Peter 2.22 that he did no sin Neither was guile found in his mouth. When I contemplate those passages and others like them, I stand amazed. Because as you live life and strive to know and do God's will, you realize as best you can as a mere human what it took for him to never transgress God's will in thought, word, or action. He never omitted a thing he should do. He never violated anything. Of God's will. To provide healing from, for sin, and some righteous one had to offer himself in the place of those who were unrighteous. Jesus is the one that did that. He's the only one that could have done that. Peter wrote again in 1 Peter 3.18, Christ also suffered for sins once, the righteous for the unrighteous. What was the purpose of it? He tells us that he might bring us to God. Jesus never lost sight of that part of his work as the great physician. Christ prepared himself in eternity before time and then 
continued his preparation as we would think of at least as a as men I say continued his preparation in this life in the flesh because he lived without sin that he might become the great physician well another point about a good physician a good physician is certified He's given, given credentials that say he has met a certain level of study and knowledge. And this permits him to practice medicine. Not only must one be trained, one be qualified, so one must be certified. One must be licensed. That's the proof of his qualification. I think you'll see there are three kinds of certification of his preparation and qualifications. Notice this from his Father in heaven. Matthew 3, verses 16 and 17. When Jesus came up from the baptismal waters, the heavens were opened, opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and light upon him. That's John, the immerser, who had baptized him. But here's the thing we're interested in right here. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. We come over to Matthew 17, 5. The Mount of Transfiguration. Peter speaking. And the scripture says, While he yet spake, Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. Then you read John telling us by inspiration in John 8, 18. Jesus saying, The Father beareth witness of me. So they're the direct statements from the Father as credentials that he is able to do what he can do. But then you have the miracles that he did. Now, a miracle is not like a miracle drug of, as penicillin was during World War II. So in modern terminology, we use the word miracle away. The Bible doesn't. Miracle in the Bible means where ordinary things of nature and the natural ways they work are set aside. Nicodemus said to him in their discussion, We know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him, John 3, 2. And again, John closes his gospel in John 20, 30, and 31 toward the end of it. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing you might have life through his name. When Peter's sermon is recorded by Luke, as he stood up with the rest of the apostles on that first Pentecost feast day following the resurrection of Christ, it is recorded that Peter said to them in the midst of his sermon, Jesus of Nazareth, now listen, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you. Pretty plain. You have to say, you either believe and accept that, and what it implies, or you just say that's a lie. Then there's scriptural attestation. You have all the promises, you have the prophecies, you have the types and the shadows, the whole Old Testament. All of that foretold and identified Christ. And the law itself was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. The Holy Spirit through Paul wrote the churches of Galatians, Galatians 3.24. And in Luke 24.27, as they walk on the road, two men to Emmaus, and the Lord appears to them, they don't recognize him. They mention after he leaves them, and beginning from Moses, from all the prophets, he, Christ, interpreted to them and all the scriptures the things 
concerning himself. I use the word interpreted there <clears throat> because that is the Greek word for hermeneutics. He showed by rightly dividing the word of truth the fulfillment of all of those prophecies. I have yearned many times in his wishful thinking. It can't be. But wouldn't you have liked to have been walking along listening to that when the Lord showed all these fulfillments himself in himself? Never has another doctor lived who had such divine certification as Christ, the only begotten Son of God, and by which we correctly call him the great physician of which there's no greater. The proof of a good physician is what he's able to do for his patient. What he's able to do for his patient. And he goes to school and he studies and he practices so that he'll be able to treat a given illness or illnesses or certain injuries. Well, Christ didn't fail one time in his work. Medical doctors who are human certainly do. They misdiagnose. They can't get this done. They can't get that done, no matter how learned they are, because the human element's there and the finite knowledge and the weakness of men. We don't have to worry about that when it comes to Jesus Christ when it comes to the great physician who heals us from our sins. Our Lord failed no time, not one time in his work as a great physician, and he doesn't to this day. That was true, of course, of the miraculous work of physical healing. There wasn't any of those things that were too hard for him. Person blind from birth, what was that to him? He gave him his sight. Miraculously, immediately. Crippled from the womb. He healed him immediately. Deaf. Woman with an issue of blood. And even the servant of the high priest has ear healed. And it was instantaneously. Beyond these we know, at least as the scriptures record, at least three occasions that he raised people from the dead. And it's so amazing that gullible people today, ignorant of the scriptures and the right division of the word, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, are deceived by these modern fake healers. They claim to heal, but they can't. They lie. And they deceive. Well, Jesus never fails when it comes to spiritual healing. You'll notice we remind you of John 20, 30, and 31 again of his demonstration of his power over all physical forces. And that proved him to be the Son of God. Before him and without him, men were and are as is said to the Ephesian brethren by Paul in Ephesians 2 and verse 12, they were and are without hope and without God in the world. In Ephesians 2.13, Paul says to the brethren, but now in Christ Jesus, those who were far off are made near or nigh in the blood of Christ. And the scripture says of Jesus himself that he came to seek and to save that which was lost, Luke 19.10. And I've already mentioned John 1.29. He's the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. And that's the case because he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. So the righteous could die for the unrighteous. He is the sole mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. And the scripture says later, following that comment, 1 Timothy 2, 5, and 6, that he gave himself a ransom for all. And as I've also mentioned many times, I don't know that a sermon hardly goes by, I don't use it, what Jesus said of himself in John 14, 6, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes of the Father but by me. And then Hebrews 1 and verse 3, Scripture says that when he had purged our sins, 
that he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. That's where he is now. Ever living to make intercession for us, the only mediator between God and man, ready to forgive when we love the truth and obey it. Those who say that Christ failed in his first commission and he's coming back later to accomplish what he couldn't accomplish then because the unbelieving Jews wouldn't let him are simply speaking blasphemy. They don't know the truth. They deny purpose, the very purpose of his coming, which was to save the lost, Luke 19.10. He didn't come to set up a political kingdom like Rome or some other kingdom. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. So by implication, these people deny scriptural identity of his kingdom, the church, the body of Christ, the family of God. But Paul, by inspiration, connected all of those. To the church in Colossae, Paul wrote, who, speaking of God, delivered us out of the power of darkness and that translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. The American standard says the son of his love. In whom we have our redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. I think a good summation of the effect of his work is found by Paul, Paul written by Paul in Colossians 2, 13. And you, being dead through your trespasses, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, you, I say, did he make alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Now, note that he did not merely come with the intent or in, uh, in an attempt to save man from this horrible disease of sin. He did it. And those who say that God could have saved man by some other means than the sacrifice of his son are nothing less than vain babblers that know nothing. If that could have been possible and he didn't do it, then he's the worst sadist that ever was and sending his son when he could have done it another way and watching his son die needlessly at the hands of his enemies. Folks, get this in mind. There was no other way and both the father and the son knew it. You see some of this in Christ's prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But here's what I'm so glad is on that passage and that he practiced it. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So Christ succeeded in providing healing for the worst of all diseases of which man is blind to many times, and that's sin, because it ends in spiritual death. And if not taken care of in this life, it's an eternity, no end. And spiritual death and the devil's hell. And yet the great physician is here to heal you. And by the way, you don't have to get an appointment. And you don't have to get there for an appointment at 1030 and wait to 12 to see him. You don't have to do that. You know, even the best doctor is powerless if patient won't follow his prescription. Think about that. And this is no less true of the great physician. God commanded that we're to hear his son and to do what he commanded, Matthew 17, 5. Men must, it's imperative, observe all things he's commanded, Matthew 28, 20. And Christ would even say, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? And it's fruitless folly to call him Lord. And ignore his word, Luke 6, 46. If we reject his prescription, we reject him, John 12, 48. Where Jesus said, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, these same shall judge him in the last day. 
Now, this applies both to alien sinners and saints. In other words, if you're not a Christian, you're still in your sins, there's a plan of salvation. But you must hear the Word of God and from that have faith in Christ, Romans 10, 17. Repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30. Confess your belief in Christ to be the Son of God, Romans chapter 10, verse 10. And be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins by His authority, Acts 2, verse 38. To the one who is a Christian, that person must repent of his sins. Confess them and pray God for forgiveness. That's God's second law of pardon. Now, none of that's hard intellectually to understand if you'll take the time and study it. And, you know, a lot of things are hard to understand when you won't take the time and have no interest in studying it. Saints dare not ignore his directions to them or they'll be lost too, according to Hebrews 2, 1 and 3. Now, we end the lesson by simply saying, the great physician awaits and says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest in your soul. Well, what a thought. Nobody else can do that. The best of medical doctors, psychiatrists, or whatever they are, cannot do that. Christ can, and he will never forsake you and leave you if you love him and obey him. And thus, the great physician stands ready to forgive us if we're ready to take his diagnosis and the prescription and fill it and take what he said and apply it to our lives. If you're subject to the Lord's blessed invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.